Well, amen. Amen. I, I can't get this thought out of my head. Um, I, I have a sense, uh, because we here, I'm sure, are feeling it. I'm feeling it. I have a sense that you at home are feeling this too, that, that uh, nothing going on in this world today can steal the hope that we have. And uh, I just, I, I feel a very real sense of hope during this dark time, and I hope you do too. And as believers, nothing, nothing can tamp down, nothing can squash the hope that we have as believers um, in Christ. As Cameron has already said a couple times this morning, that, that, that against the darkest night, uh, the, the brightest hope and the brightest uh, stars shine, and um, and so I hope you're feeling the hope of Jesus today. Uh, so let's look at that hope. Mark chapter 16, Mark's account of the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to read verses 1 through 3 again. It says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Very quickly, just before we get into the rest of this passage, I want you to see something. I want you to see that the love of Christ that was displayed here, a love actually for Christ that was displayed here by these women. Jesus, whom these women dearly loved, he had died on Friday. And the Sabbath being over... They went very early on Sunday to anoint the body of their Lord in, in one last act of love to help take away the smell of death. Now, I don't want you to overlook what an incredible display of love this was. The horrible smell of a decaying body that they thought they would encounter didn't deter them from going. Their love was greater having no plan to remove the large stone didn't deter them. It was probably a stone that, that had been, it probably had a little track in it and it, it had probably rolled downhill to the, to the front entrance of the tomb. And so it being a large stone and having to roll it uphill, how, how were they going to do that? But that didn't deter them from going. Their love was greater. And even identifying themselves with Jesus when the white-hot outrage and opposition to him was likely still aflame, thus putting themselves in jeopardy too, it didn't deter them. Their love was greater. Jesus is worthy of such great love. So, so how about you? Is your love for Jesus so great that personal comforts, Seemingly impossible logistics or opposition can't deter your extravagant expressions of a lifestyle of love to him. Has your love for Jesus grown dim? Oh, Christian, look at the great love of your Savior for you and let your love for him arise. But I want to take you to the, uh, the middle of this passage, verses 4 through 6, and I want you to see the gospel of Christ Proclaimed. Listen to verses 4 through 6. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. As the women arrived at the tomb, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. And going in, there was an angel. That young man in the white robe was an angel. Going in, an angel there in the tomb declared, You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. They had gone to the tomb when the sun had risen and found out that the sun had risen. Hallelujah. They got to see with their own two eyes that he had risen from the place where he was laid. 
They had seen earlier when, when he was placed in the tomb, in, in the last verse, I think in Mark 15, some women were there, some of these women were there and saw where he was laid. We can be assured today that Christ is risen from the dead. Though many people have tried to explain away the truth of his resurrection, there is no explanation for the empty tomb except that he is risen. No one even back then disputed that his tomb was empty. Even the guards at the tomb, who stood to be in great trouble for failing to guard the body, they didn't deny that the tomb was empty. The chief priests, who stood to lose if the story of a resurrected Jesus got out, they didn't dispute that the tomb was empty. In fact, Matthew 28 tells us that they circulated a story that the disciples stole the body, which is an absolutely ridiculous assertion. One, the grave clothes were still there, so if you're going to take a body out and steal it, it's wrapped in grave clothes, probably the grave clothes are going with it. And two, we're, we're assuming that scared of the Jews, scared of the Roman guards, disciples who, who fearful of their lives, could have taken on a, a uh, a group of Roman guards that were there moved a stone. If if the guards were asleep, the stone wouldn't it have woken them up, waking them up, woken them up. You know, we're we're that that theory is asking us to believe something absolutely preposterous. Jesus was truly risen. The women didn't go to the wrong tomb. They knew where he was laid. And the angel's declaration when they saw him assures us they were at the right tomb. And speaking of the women, if early believers fabricated the resurrection, it would have been silly to assert that women were the first witnesses. Women's testimony back then, it wasn't reliable, it wasn't respected. But the gospel writers felt no need to hide the facts as they happened. And I, I just love this fact too, the affirmation of of women that Jesus showed, that they were the first to know of his victorious resurrection. I love that. Mary Magdalene thought someone took his body in John chapter 20, uh, but after she saw Jesus, she said to the disciples in verse 18, John 20, I have seen the Lord. He was risen. Jesus appeared to so many after his resurrection, even over 500 people at one time. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus appeared mul multiple times to his disciples, and this changed them from being afraid behind locked doors for fear of the Jews to being bold declarers of the gospel, of our risen Savior. We see them doing that in Acts. We see them boldly going to declare the gospel of our risen Savior in the same place, Jerusalem, that Jesus died and, and where he was buried where opposition to him was still alive and, and their lives were in jeopardy. But they went and preached anyway because they believed in a resurrected Savior. And they go preach in this place where he was died and buried so that all the Jewish leaders would have had to have done to undercut the message of a resurrected Savior, squashing this new movement of Christ followers, would be to show a body of Jesus. But they couldn't do it. And you know why? He was risen. According to church history, 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred for their faith. Were martyred for believing and preaching in a resurrected Christ. And not one of them, in trying to save uh, his life, said that they made the story of his resurrection up. People have died for a lie before. We know this. But people will not die for what they know to be a lie if they know that it can save their life by telling the truth. But they never denied Jesus was risen. It was a truth worth dying for. Paul himself went from being a Christ hater and a persecutor of the church, well on his way to the top of the Jewish religious totem pole, to become not only a Christian himself, but the great missionary to the Gentiles, going against his Jewish brethren that opposed Jesus. All because he saw the risen Christ. Even James, Jesus' brother, didn't believe in Jesus 
Mark 7, 5 tells us that. But Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 7. And we see James in the New Testament. I love this. We see James in the New Testament as a believer, a leader in the church. He wrote the book of James in the New Testament. And according to church history, he too was martyred for his faith. The resurrection is the only explanation for such a change in these people. Folks, we can believe it because our scripture tells it, but there is, we, just, we know we know that Jesus is risen and we can rest in that hope today. The angel declared to the women, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. And Friday was a really dark day, literally. As all hopes and dreams of those who followed Jesus seemed to die when he died. But what was truly happening when he died? Why was there literal darkness for three hours in the middle of the day as Jesus hung on that cross? Because Jesus was receiving the penalty that our sins deserved so that we could be forgiven by a holy God. You see, this is the simple gospel message. We are sinners who fall way short of God's glory. We fall way short of his perfect, holy, righteous standard that he requires from us. We aren't righteous. And we can't do enough good to outweigh our bad to be acceptable to God. <laughs> Think about it like this. Think about if someone is choosing a spouse. They might look at a spouse and go, or a prospective future spouse and say, you know what? Well... You know, they got this bad trait or this bad quality or, 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 or this bad thing about them. But man, they're really kind and they're giving and they love Jesus. And all the good things that, about them that they love so much would lead them to say, you know, I can deal with a little bit of their imperfections. But God doesn't work like that. Any amount of sin is unacceptable to God. And we are riddled with it. It's inherent in all of us, and it's not okay. The holy and just nature of God requires that sin be punished. We can't be married to Christ without something done about our sin. No matter how small or large our sin is, the holy and just nature of God requires that sin be punished. And so because of our sin, we justly deserve God's eternal wrath in hell. And scripture says that we will receive that if our sin is not removed. If we aren't seen by God as perfectly righteous. Wow, that's a hopeless thought. But it's into this hopelessness that Jesus steps. You see, we don't have the perfect righteousness that God requires, but Jesus does. Jesus, God in the flesh, he never sinned. And he obviously has no sin for which to be punished. Only he could bear our sin in our place and suffer the penalty for it. So out of great love, God sent Jesus to do that very thing. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Charles Spurgeon says this. My sins were the scourges which lacerated those blessed shoulders and crowned with thorn those bleeding brows. My sins cried, crucify him, crucify him, and laid the cross upon his gracious shoulders. The sin that you take so lightly, the sin that you like to, de to deny that you have or ignore that you have, the sin that you like to justify and say it's okay. The sin that you compare to others' sin and think it's not so bad. That ugly sin caused the ugly, bloody death of Jesus, the Holy Son of God. Jesus Christ, the Holy One, became sin for us. Jesus Christ, the omnipotent, all-powerful one, became weak for us. Jesus Christ, in whom the Father was well pleased, had the wrath of God poured on him. 
for us, for your sin, for my sin. So do you still want to minimize your sin? Do you still want to be indifferent to it? Do you still want to continue in it? May it never be. I, I read a, a, a tweet the other day, I think yesterday, by a guy named Gavin Peacock. He says this, he says, Does God hate sin? Look at the cross. Of course he does. Does God love sinners? Look at the cross. Of course he does. Do you want forgiveness, hope, and eternal life? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. That which would take you to an eternal hell was taken by Jesus, and he suffered in your place for it so you wouldn't have to. Listen to 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation just means he took our wrath. So in the death of Jesus, God's great love for sinners was displayed and his justice for sin was satisfied. Listen to Romans 4, the last part of 24 and verse 25. Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So one significance of Jesus' resurrection is that it is God's declaration that Jesus' sacrifice was full payment for our sin. And that he accepted Jesus' death as sufficient to remove our sins and justify us before him. And Jesus took our unrighteousness upon himself, receiving God's wrath that we deserve. And now he offers to us the free gift of his perfect righteousness, making us acceptable to God. Based on his righteousness given, not any righteous attempts, acts that we attempt, that we try to earn. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I use this illustration often, and so since we may have many that, that haven't heard, I want to share this. And just think about two twin brothers, one innocent, one on death row. And the innocent brother goes to visit his condemned brother on death row. And as he goes to visit him, he changes clothes with him. And the innocent brother takes on the clothes of the guilty. And the guilty takes on the clothes of the innocent. And the innocent goes to be condemned while the guilty goes to live innocent and free. And that's what Jesus did for you. He took your unrighteousness and he went to be condemned so that you could take on his righteousness and go live free and forgiven forever. He offers you this gift of forgiveness and righteousness freely. To be saved, we receive it. We turn from our sins in repentance and we put our faith in Jesus' work alone for our salvation. Let me read to you Ephesians chapter 2, um, the first six verses. If, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus for our salvation, li listen to the hope. Listen to what your testimony is if you do that. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in, the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of Excuse me. the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, wrath like the rest of mankind. Listen, church. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, you who were once dead in your sin, headed to an eternal hell, are now made alive in Christ, raised with him, seated with him in the heavenly places. Glory to God. For those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, listen to the hope of Romans 8.34. 
Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? So because he is risen and he has ascended to the throne of God alive today, he now stands before God as our advocate, testifying that he was condemned in our place, assured he never will be. Praise the Lord. So just very quickly, three other reasons that the resurrection of Jesus is great news. One, it proves that we are following the true Lord. Romans 1.4 says this, speaking of Jesus, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, his resurrection, Jesus' resurrection distinguishes Christianity from any other religious it proves that he is Lord. He's the only way. He's the truth. He's the life. And eternal life are found only in him. He is God. So submit to his lordship. Two. Number two reason why the resurrection of Jesus is such great news. God's power displayed in the resurrection is active in the believer's life to make us alive and new now. Listen to Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see, his power is so great that he can change a sinner's stubborn heart to be one that lives for him. And wants to live for him. We don't have to sin anymore. But we can live alive to righteousness by the power of God. Wow. Believer, live new today. Living new, living a brand new life, following Jesus, turning from your sin. That is a certain fruit of your salvation if you're saved. Live new today. You, by the resurrection power of Jesus, he gives us the power to be made new. Praise the Lord. And number three, reason why the resurrection is good news for us. As Jesus was raised in a physical body to eternal glory, the power of God defeated sin and death. So likewise, by God's power, death will not prevail over believers. We will be raised to eternal life in new, glorified bodies, free from sin and free from suffering. Jesus wasn't forsaken in death, nor will you be, believer, if you trust in Jesus for your salvation. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, 14. God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. So believer, live hopeful of that day in a world of hope, hopelessness. You know, I think of Mary Magdalene when she first went to the tomb and she saw that it was empty and she wept. What she didn't understand at that time was that the empty tomb wasn't a reason to weep, but a reason to rejoice. The empty tomb brings the fullest hope. And so lastly, I just want you to see verse, verse 7. The, the angel says, go hit, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of them to Galilee. Notice that the angel specifically told the women to go tell Peter that Jesus was going ahead of them to Galilee. And Peter. After Jesus said they'd all fall away from him that night that he was arrested, Peter said this, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. But we know Peter did, right? He denied him three times. He went out and he wept. Bitterly, though Peter had blown it big time, he had denied the Lord, not once, but three times. Jesus still wanted to see him. Peter was still one of his disciples. His failure didn't remove him from the Savior's love. The Savior wanted to bring backslidden Peter home to himself. So believe him. 
Do you remember that time in your life that you swore that your love for Jesus would never grow cold? That you'd always follow him faithfully and obediently? Maybe you've blown it. So if you're a believer, Jesus wants to assure you that you are his. Come back to him like Peter did. Weep over your sin. Confess it. Repent and turn to Jesus. You are his. And you'll find the arms of a welcoming father when you return. Ready to receive and restore the repentant sinner to his great kingdom purposes for you. His grace is greater than your sin. There's a quick story of, of back in the 1920s, I think, uh, UCLA and Georgia Tech were playing in the Rose Bowl. And there was a guy named Roy Regals. And he played for UCLA. And he recovered a fumble. And he, 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 got, he got confused. And instead of running to the end zone that would have scored a touchdown for his team, he, ran, he started running to the other end zone. And I think he ran for like 65 yards until one of his own team members tackled him. Stopped him from scoring a safety for the other team. That was in the first half. He goes into halftime. He's crying. Got his blanket around him. He's just sobbing in embarrassment and shame. As they're about to go back out to the second half, the coach says, the same people who started the first half are starting the second half. That included Roy Regals. He, didn't, he couldn't believe it. Coach went over to him. And Roy Regals was like, I, I, I can't. I'm embarrassed. I can't go back out in front of those people. I've shamed you. I've shamed me. The coach said, that, that was just the first half. There's a whole half to play. And the story goes on that, that he went out and he played hard that second half. That's a picture of what God wants to do and will do. For believers, if they'll return to him, if they've blown it big time. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. So believer, come back to him. Repent and come back. Follow him faithfully. Get back in the game. But if you're not a believer... You're still headed in the wrong direction. You're headed to the enemy's end zone. You're headed to your eternal destruction. What you need is God to come tackle you and stop you. May he tackle you with his love today. May he arrest you with his love today. Maybe you feel like your sin is a quantum leap beyond what Peter did and feel like God won't forgive you. But just think about Paul. Paul was this Christ hater persecuting the church. But the risen Christ appeared to him, Paul was saved, and he became the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. And this is what Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15. The, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Richard Sibb says, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. If Paul can be saved... You can be saved. If you confess your sin, if you turn from it in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior of your sin and Lord of your life, He'll save you and He'll give you the hope that the resurrection assures us. Uh, Danny Aiken says, Jesus is indeed the risen Lord. You can reject Him, but you cannot ignore Him. What Jesus did in rising from the dead demands a response. How will you respond to the risen Lord and King of the universe? It's a question that cannot be avoided. And so if you're an unbeliever, we encourage you to respond today, to trust in Christ. In a moment, I'll pray and, and give you a chance to respond to Christ. On our website, if you look on the front page, you'll see a, a, a part of our front page where, where you can click and you can share with us any response you made to Christ today, any questions you may have or or or. Uh, if you want to ask us to, to, to talk or have some conversations about following Jesus, you can respond through our website in that way. Believer in Jesus, we have a victorious, risen Savior who won our salvation to forever hope, saving us from the eternal wrath of God. What incredible news to share. So go share it. 
Wrath is coming to unbelievers. Stuart Sheehan says, if a giant cloud of COVID-19 were headed to your neighborhood, would you tell anyone to get out of the way? So much worse is coming to unbelievers. So may we go tell them of the rescue and the hope available from our loving, risen Lord, that they may be made alive in the risen Christ. Believer, go share this news. If you are an unbeliever and you'd like to turn to Christ, and you're wanting to turn to him today, I'm going to pray. And if you just want to pray with me, inviting Christ into your life, let's do that now. Jesus, we thank you for your great work for us on the cross. We confess that we are sinners. We deserve wrath. You are holy. But we believe that the perfect Son of God died in our place, that we might be forgiven. We believe that he rose victoriously over sin and over death, and the payment is paid in full. And so, Jesus, we receive his forgiveness and the righteousness that you offer in Christ. We turn from our sin. We want to follow you. And thank you, Jesus, for saving us. If you prayed that prayer, we'd like for you to let us know about it. And so do that in some way. Glory to God for the hope of the resurrected Christ. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to Yeah.